Hi, everyone. Welcome to Big Ideas 2022. My name is Yasin Almandra. I'm an analyst at ARC focused on all things Bitcoin and public blockchains. Uh, really excited to dive into our research, especially with all the market volatility. It feels like the perfect time to discuss why we have such high conviction in the asset class and what the long term opportunities look like. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive right in. In 2020, uh, when Bitcoin was still trading under $10,000, we published a two part white paper outlining Bitcoin's value proposition. Um, and in it, we defined Bitcoin and public blockchains broadly as novel trust minimizing institutions. Uh, now, to better understand what that means, uh, we can look at it in relation to traditional trust based institutions. So today, most institutions rely heavily on centrally controlled intermediaries to enforce the rules, the record keeping, the general decision making of a system. Uh, this is commonly known as a trust based model where the integrity of an institution is a function of those controlling the institution. And as institutions grow in importance, the entities controlling them accumulate more power and effectively expose participants to harmful behavior. Um, enter public blockchains, which fundamentally shift how a system distributes trust by replacing that intermediary with decentralized open source software. Now, the first and most profound application is self-sovereign digital money or Bitcoin, uh, where in 2009, the anonymous Satoshi Nakamoto published a white paper introducing Bitcoin as a decentralized peer to peer global monetary system. Uh, and as you can see in the graphic, in contrast to a central bank that controls monetary policy or a commercial bank that controls the custody of assets or a payment processor, that controls transaction settlement, the Bitcoin network, which at its core is free and open source software, oversees all such functions and does so in a way uh, that highly aligns market participants. If we dive a little deeper into the characteristics of this software, we, we get a sense of just how unique it is relative to uh, the status quo. Uh, so, Public blockchains are intended to be decentralized. In the case of Bitcoin, there are nodes or volunteer computers that run Bitcoin software to verify the network's integrity. Uh, node operators can range from individuals to large companies. Public blockchains are open source, as I mentioned. This means that it's code that lives on the internet that individuals can run and copy and create their own variant at any time. Uh, public blockchains are user run uh, in their purest and most valuable form there's no company or centralized team behind the system. Uh, and in the case of Bitcoin, nodes are really only one part of that user base. Bitcoin incorporates a unique system of checks and balances between miners, developers, users, and nodes intended to encourage protocol innovation and maintenance while making sure that any changes are in the interest of stakeholders. And finally, public blockchains are permissionless. Um, this means that uh, Bitcoin specifically allows anyone to participate doesn't rely on a centralized authority to determine the eligibility of participants, and it identifies individual users by cryptographic digital keys. Um, so each private key is unique and actually doesn't even require access to the internet to possess. Um, now this last point around permissionlessness is, is quite important. Um, private key cryptography is a core component of these systems and, and really unlocks the ability to faithfully represent scarcity and ownership in the digital world. Uh, so the Bitcoin network facilitates the transfer and custody of Bitcoin, a scarce digital asset, and the value of Bitcoin provides the economic incentive for stakeholders to maintain the system's integrity and ultimately benefit from its price appreciation. Uh, so the idea of faithfully representing scarcity in the digital world in the form of digital assets that are issued on this public open source infrastructure can really be generalized to the idea of embedding economics into open source software, which has profound implications as our lives increasingly shift from the physical to the digital world. Um, so the introduction of Bitcoin has, has birthed an asset class that not only sits outside the framework of traditional asset classes, but will likely transform them in uh, a profound way. This framing, which was uh, initially introduced by uh, Balaji Srinivasan, provides perspective on just how transformative digital assets that are issued on public blockchains can be. In the same way people held the limiting belief that the internet was just going to be a new channel among ones like the radio or TV or newspaper, 
Uh, people think that crypto assets issued on public blockchains are just a separate and distinct asset class. Uh, with, with some who are even more skeptical that don't even think that this is an asset class at all. Uh, we believe that similar to how the internet ended up facilitating all channels, uh, crypto assets issued on public blockchains are likely to impact all asset classes. Money, of course, being the, the most profoundly impacted through Bitcoin, uh, but this concept really extends to broader stores of value like art, to commodities, and, and to even the, the joint stock company. We can further dimension this framing into a, a narrative more relevant to what we see in the market today. Um, so ultimately the, the unifying innovation across all public blockchains by introducing kind of this trust minimized institution is the ability to scale and lower the costs of coordinating trust. Um, money at its core is a coordination problem. Um, and, and the type of coordination that public blockchains unlocks um, can vary um, in, in both levels in, of importance and in, in the degrees of trust that is required for those specific use cases. Uh, but broadly, we think the introduction of Bitcoin has introduced three uh, parallel revolutions, uh, one in money, uh, one in financial services, and one in kind of consumer internet. Uh, and our, our research at ARC uh, has, has really been centered around the monetary revolution. But the last two years have clearly proven how public blockchains can serve use cases outside of that. Um, Ethereum has attracted significant mindshare through its application of decentralized finance, which is enabling users to globally and permissionlessly access financial services from borrowing and lending to market making to gaining synthetic exposure to the U.S. dollar through stable coins. Uh, and now with the rise of NFTs and decentralized identity and, and the increasing power of, of big data tech companies, uh, public blockchains also appear to be catalyzing a third revolution um, in a next generation Internet, which would effectively give users the ability to own their online identities, uh, control their own data and, and turn platforms like Twitter and Facebook into dumb terminals. Part of the reason why uh, we decided to delineate the revolutions in the way that we did is also to highlight our views on some of the competitive dynamics that are emerging. Um, so with all the innovation that's happening, especially uh, the, the last year, many are posing the question of, you know, how can we be certain that Bitcoin isn't the MySpace to Facebook because it's slow and inefficient relative to other chains? Or how do we know that something like Solana isn't going to outshine Ethereum because it requires lower transaction fees? The short answer is there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs and these trade-offs are made to achieve the functionality and security appropriate for a specific use case. So in a lot of ways, comparing blockchains that are competing in, in different revolutions is an apples to oranges comparison. Uh, you know, I'd like to highlight how a lot of newer market participants often wonder why Bitcoiners are interested only in Bitcoin and fault them for being closed minded and unwilling to compromise given so many technically superior alternatives exist. And the answer is that most Bitcoiners, one, are only interested in participating in this monetary revolution and do so for philosophical reasons more than investment reasons. Um, and two, the lack of willingness to compromise actually highlights the important qualities Bitcoin possesses, uh, where we believe that are necessary to uh, compete in this monetary revolution. Uh, so some of Bitcoin's principles, uh, which in our view can't be replicated by other public blockchains, include a strong regard for property rights, a predictability in the monetary policy, a commitment to cheap validation and decentralization, a fairness in issuance enabled by proof of work, uh, and an overall philosophy that stresses conservatism over innovation and experimentation. So this makes it the, the prime candidate for competing in a money revolution, a revolution that necessitates decentralization and security um, above all else. Uh, so it's not to say that other protocols are without merit, but it's to say they opt for different trade-offs and tend to prioritize experimentation over security and stability. Now, the, the graphic or the spectrum that you see in this slide um, really kind of shows uh, how on the left side of the axis are, are uh, is the monetary revolution that prioritizes uh, minimizing trust above all else or decentralizing trust above all else. Uh, but as we move along the spectrum and into the financial and internet revolutions, public blockchains like Ethereum and to an even larger extent Solana or Avalanche or Terra and to an even larger extent uh, Binance Smart Chain uh, are trading off that trust minimization or that decentralization for uh, convenience, for more features, for higher throughput. 
Um, and it appears that making some sort of trade-off relative to what's required in the monetary revolution is necessary to compete in the financial and internet revolution. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that the market is still deciding what the perfect balance of trade-offs is. Uh, and because it remains unclear, evolving networks might run the risk of over-centralizing and reverting to the institutional status quo, uh, which is shown at the, at the furthest right of the spectrum. Uh, the main takeaway here, uh, you know, as, as we wrap up this overview section and, and the remaining uh, sections of the big ideas, uh, at least in the crypto side, is going to be going through the money revolution, the internet revolution, um, and the financial revolution, is, is that comparing blockchains uh, without recognizing their distinctive designs, use cases, and value propositions is counterproductive. Uh, this is why we've dimensioned this as, as three separate revolutions that are evolving in parallel. Uh, with, of course, the, the most profound in our view being the monetary revolution, uh, but that requiring different network implementations and trade-offs. Uh, ultimately, we believe this opportunity to be a positive sum game and, and the diversity does create healthy competition. Uh, so for the rest of the crypto section, we'll be diving into each of these three revolutions, uh, starting with Bitcoin and the monetary revolution.